Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is 123 with Matthew Spohr. He is the owner of Marketing the Social Good, a strategic marketing firm for B2B companies, and he also offers fractional CMO services. So I picked Matthew to be a guest because I wanted to speak with someone who had built a seven-figure portfolio, lost it, and then rebuilt it once more. I chose this topic because it's very common for entrepreneurs to go through wealth and poverty cycles. And I thought that if you heard one such story, it would help you to better prepare for your own upcoming wealth cycle, even though 2023 doesn't look good. That doesn't mean we can't be positioned for creating wealth. He has a really interesting story. So tell us, Matthew, how did you make it? How did you lose it? And we'll go from there. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, absolutely, Sean. Great to see you again, by the way. Um, So I started my career, I was a lucky English major who got to be a technical writer at Microsoft. And uh, very early on, like we're talking way back in the Reagan administration, frankly. Um, And and that was good for me. It wasn't as good as the developers I know who made piles of money at the time, but I made enough, right? Um, And so that plus some time was able to get me a seven figure portfolio. and with that, I went off to graduate school to go be a creative writer because that had always been a passion of mine. Uh, and after graduate school, I started a weekly newspaper. And, and that's where it all went downhill because um, it was sort of the perfect storm of everything, right? Startups are tough. And uh, at Microsoft, we had the term of investment mode, right? We're, we're putting money into something. And uh, newspapers are notorious for that. Uh, and in fact, the, the title of my book, Making a Small Fortune, comes from the joke of how do you make a small fortune? You take your slightly larger fortune and start an X, right? Every industry uses this joke. For me, it's start a newspaper. Um, but at the time, I ran into not only tough local politics, but the Wall Street tech bubble burst, and then 9-11 happened, and then my family also had two pretty, very severe medical Um, conditions. Both my my new wife and one of her sons at the time developed a very severe and rare disease. Um, And all of that was just a perfect storm to, you know, not have success in business because it's very hard to focus with all of that going on. And so after four years in business, I had to close my newspaper. What was the hardest part from starting that first company? There were a lot of hard parts. a lot of it was just uh, just a sort of an operational steep learning curve. Because not only did I do this, I, I started a business having never owned a business before, which probably a lot of your audience does, but I hadn't gone to business school and I was doing journalism as a business, but I'd never worked on a newspaper, never taken a journalism class, never sold an ad. I mean, I was just a rookie at all of this. I was, I'm you know, I'm smart and I had good like computer skills. Obviously I was a writer, you know, I had some native stuff, but learning all of those other things just operationally was hard. The people part was also hard too, because it wasn't just me. It was, you know, I have employees now and I have to do what, those are the most messy, complicated and amazing pieces of equipment any business is going to have. And so there was a lot of that that went on too. That was hard. Um, And then also just trying to find balance, right? There was a lot of family stuff going on, good and bad for me. So how do you balance all of the work stuff and still have a life? People say work-life balance is a thing, but it's not. Because you're either working or you're living. You can't do both. You, You can't really balance them unless you say, I've got eight hours in the day that I'm committing to one thing and four hours goes into one and four hours goes into the other. But that's not how life works, especially if you have a spouse and kids, because those eight hours, you think you got eight hours, but really it's, it's not like that gets dwindled down really fast. The term I like is work-life integration, right? How do they fit together? Not they're two separate things that balance, but there's two things that should mesh. They should come together. And how do they do that? Um, and, and sometimes there's just too much to put together, right? Then it becomes like not integrated. And that was kind of my case. There was just so much going on. I think a lot of business owners struggle to do that, especially in their first time. I know my ex-wife complained often that I was working too much. And it's not like I wanted to be working. Like if I had 
I mean, I did have a choice. We all have a choice about how we manage our time, but like in a perfect world for me, I would never work and I would always spend time with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> right. But obviously that's not how it works. How difficult was it before you found out about her illness? It was manageable, I'll say. I mean, it was still, as they say, drinking from a fire hose. I was still learning stuff, um, but it was okay. And we were making progress um, towards being, you know, getting out of that investment mode, knowing what we're doing. We started um, publishing two issues a month and we wanted to get to weekly. And so we were we were climbing up this curve and, and that was going well. But then the whole 9-11 thing and then my wife's illness um, happened pretty much at the same time. She 9-11 was just a weird day in general. Um, and, and Shortly after that is when she really started feeling like I have too much on my plate to do both this startup because she was the editor of the paper and take care of the kids and the family and be the person who I want to be. I, I can't I can't integrate both of these. Right. They're, they're not fitting together and something's got to go. And I can't I have to prioritize the kids, which totally made sense. Um, but then it just became harder one because i lost a really valuable ally at the office and then at home i gained somebody who needed a lot more support just a lot more support um and so that that made it exponentially harder what was your actual business model what what was your newspaper about so our newspaper was called the local planet weekly and and we really wanted to cover our local planet um it was the same sort of paper um, and maybe not everybody's seen these, but um, the Village Voice, LA Weekly, Chicago Reader, those sorts of, the Stranger in Seattle, Willamette Weekly in Portland, those are sort of the biggies, but they're known as alternative newspapers. Um, usually come out on a weekly cycle. They try to do more in-depth stuff, more critique. Uh, they also cover a lot of local culture, arts, fashion, things going on about town. The business model is the paper is free to the reader. They can just go pick it up. The It's um, supported by advertising. Um, you know, if I could get a quarter for every issue that people picked up, I would have been rich, but that's not the model. Um, and so it's all, all definitely advertiser driven. And this was happening at a time when the whole advertising driven model was being completely turned on its head because of the internet, right? That's when a lot of this advertising driven content started showing up. And also classified advertising just went away because there was a thing called Craigslist, which was new then. And um, believe it or not, also one thing that sustains a lot of alternative newspapers, especially in their early days is sex advertising or sex oriented advertising. So things like strip clubs, um, sex toy shops, um, escorts even, they're all legal businesses, but they're not necessarily the ones that are gonna show up in the daily paper. But they, they deserve a place to advertise to. And if we're alternative, those are maybe sort of alternative businesses. Um, people said that Spokane was too much of a prudish town to support an alternative newspaper. Um, and they are probably right to a little bit, um, but that's that's definitely the model. Advertising supported, um, free to the reader, um, kind of looks a little bit like the internet, except on paper in some ways. Sounds very complicated. <laughs> At least th with having benefit of 20 years looking back on that, that period, it, it seems like it would have been a very difficult business to run. It's tough. I mean, you've got you've got two different audiences you have to serve, right? Lots of businesses, they, here's my customer, right? And in that model, you've got two customers. You've got to serve the readers because those are the people that are going to see the ads. And you've got to serve the advertisers because those are the people who are paying for the service. And so you have to balance both of those. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's not like we have one app or we have one website or one whatever. I mean, it's kind of like any content creator now where you pretty much are creating, like I, I've been doing this for over two years. I've put out 122 episodes and I've, I've made zero on it. <laughs> well, well, there's always the, you know, how am I getting paid, right? You're, you may not be getting paid for this content, 
but you may be making connections that feed into another part of your business model, right? That's part of the content game as well. Correct. But there's no reason why the content itself can't directly make money through an advertising model or a membership model. Yeah, a- absolutely. But but that's a tough game and it's only getting tougher, right? It used to be really easy, or I, I'm going to say comparatively easy, when all there was to compete was the daily paper and radio and maybe television, right? That, But then you take that same pool of advertising dollars and you split it among all of the digital stuff that's going on, plus all of those things, and it just becomes very fractious. I would say that there's probably more money available now because the because of the you know globalization. The internet really allowed globalization where before you might only be able to get advertising money from someone in your local area. Maybe if you're lucky you're getting money from someone in New York or in in Georgia or, or another part of the US. But my guests are from all over the world. And so that that network that I'm building is global, which means advertising can potentially come from any country in the world that I have access to. So I, I think the amount of money available has drastically increased. Potentially, I mean, you have a global topic too, right? You're talking about entrepreneurialism and, and business. We were talking about a city, right? And so how do you import advertising? And there are some ways, there, there are people from outside of the city that advertise, like concerts that come to town, right? They're not a local business, but they advertise in the local market. So there is some some external money to, to access, but a lot of it is just who's there, right? That's the audience we're serving. In our intro call, you had said that you learned a lot from your experience and was able to use it in other ways as time went on. So I'm curious, what are some of those things that you learned from this experience and through the experience of you know working through your wife's illness? Wow, that's a that's a big question. Um, I mean, I learned a lot about a just how tough business is. You know, I gained an appreciation for that. Uh, I ended up going and getting an MBA because I became interested in this, um, and in particular in distribution. That's a key issue of newspapers, but there's lots of other places where distribution is a major concern. So I ended up working in the energy industry, which is very much a distribution model. I ended up working in the education industry, which is also, if you think about it, a distribution model. Um, and so that became an, an interesting thing to me. That's one area, but it, that's, that's kind of you know mundane in some ways. Um, I learned a lot about myself in terms of how much am I capable of doing? I can do a ton of stuff, but I also learned the question, if I can do a bunch of stuff, should I? You know, where is the line? Um, I probably should have stopped investing in both the, the newspaper and my family at you know, unachievable rates uh, long before I did and, and really should have focused on my family. I, I, I would have been better off. They would have been better off. So I learned that about me is, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean maybe you should do something. Um, along the way, I've also learned the saying of don't be good at things you don't want to do. And so I'm trying to, to be better about that. Like I can do a bunch of stuff, but really, should I? Do I need to? Where Where's my priority? Where's the thing that I can do best that I can do uniquely? that is going to feed me as well as provide value to somebody else. Um, and then um, I think I also learned, you know, probably on a different level, just an appreciation for the role that story plays in our lives. I mean, we wrote a lot of stories, um, me and the whole staff at the local planet, and there were some amazing stories. And uh, I was answering a, a PR query the other day about, you know, have you ever saved a life? And I I said, yes, I've been a lifeguard. I, you know, I saved a life then, but our newspaper wrote stories that saved lives. I mean, literally, there's one story I think of um, about these two girls who had a very strange um, osteo disease in Spokane who were gonna lose their state health insurance. And if they lost it, they would die. Uh, and it was a, a major bureaucratic 
problem that they couldn't solve and they came to us and we wrote a story that helped them get through that log jam and get the kids the medical cover they they deserve so you know i learned that stories have value um and that's a role that i could play so um you know i was very happy to learn that you know stories do have an amazing power out there what is the most important thing related to distribution since Every business has a distribution problem. I think distribution comes back to the question of audience. Like distribution is how do you reach your audience? How do you reach them in the best way? And so to, to solve distribution, you need to understand your audience. Where are they looking for your content? How are they accessing it? Or where are they looking for your product, whatever it is, and when? So to me, that's really the, the key. The mechanics of it, like... We could get people to throw our newspaper in their car every Thursday and drive around and put it in our racks. That's what we had to do. Um, but it's where do we put those racks, right? That's how we found our people. Like we, we could put our racks in type of store A, but is that where our readers go? We had to understand where our readers were physically in order to reach them with the newspaper. And I think it's the same thing with any other business. Where are your consumers, whether it's physically or mentally, when you're trying to reach them? How do you determine that, though? Good old know your customer, market research. Um, and for the newspaper, there's two sides of the coin. It's what are we trying to achieve? Like, why are we writing what we're writing? And that's going to influence who wants to read us, but then also being able to be reflective and go out into the community and talk to people, find out where they're finding us, what makes um, a story interesting to them, what are they wanting to hear from us, and that will influence where we distribute stuff as well. So, you know, are we going to focus more on colleges versus, you know, families? Those are two different distribution areas, basically. You had said it was interesting how you discovered that stories play a role in our lives. So I'd like to ask, what roles do stories play in our lives? What did you learn from it? Wow, stories play a huge number of roles in our life. Um, I think every day when we wake up, we tell ourselves a story about what the day is going to look like, right? I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And, I, and I'm coming into the story feeling this way. You know, I'm either happy or concerned or I'm exhausted from the night before or something like that. Um, so, I mean, they really influence who we are. There's even some fascinating studies right now that show some people have a constant internal monologue going on that's narrating every action they do. Okay, I'm, I'm picking up my mug, I'm putting it down, I'm taking a drink. Um, I don't know who those people are. I would go insane if that was going on in my head all the time. But that's the type of story we're telling ourselves too. It's sort of a present tense story. Um, we tell ourselves stories about who we are as a family, as a professional, as a community, as a political person, as a financial person. Those are all stories we tell ourselves. And we tell those stories to other people too. Like, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. This is what I want to portray to you. Yeah, um, story is a huge thing. Absolutely. I remember telling my story for the longest time as, yeah, you know, I had a concussion years ago and it's, it's done this, it's done that. And I was kind of continuing to live in the past and as a victim because of, of how I still felt because of the concussion, what it did to me, how it changed me. And it was, I guess, a year or two ago. So the, the concussion was or the accident that caused the concussion was in 2013. So about a year or more ago, I said, I'm tired of living that story. I've played it out. It, it had its benefits. It's had it, its detriments, but that story is played out and I'm tired of it. And, and then I started living the story of, you know, getting divorced uh, and, and I, I'm tired of that story and I'm over it. So whenever, like I, I signed up for these research surveys and they always ask you, you know, are you single, are you married, are you divorced? And I was like, I'm single, never married. Because <laughs> technically I, I was married outside of the US. So 
the marriage was never um, uh, like we didn't sign anything with the U.S. embassy overseas. So the U.S. technically doesn't know about it. So as far as America is concerned, I am single, never married. But um, but that doesn't, you know, wh whenever I go on a date, like if it's the first date, inevitably like, oh, tell me about your, your history. It's like, well, you know, I, w I was married and now I'm not married anymore. So like it's hard to get past that story and it creates a stigma for certain people. Like, oh, well, you were married and now divorced. What does that mean about you? Right? Oh, yeah. Well, Absolutely. For me, it means I learned a lot. It means I'm, I'm much more mature about life and relationships, and I'm willing to work hard to make it last if, if I find someone right. But they got to be damn good for me to be willing to commit because I already did it once, and it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Well, you learned once. It took me more than that. So, I mean, well, part of my, 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 my story in my book and part of what kept me from, from just publishing this for a long time was uh, I got married once right out of college. It was very brief. It, you know, I shouldn't have asked. She shouldn't have said yes. Um, and, and, and that was that. I uh, got married again um, and kind of like the newspaper, worked way too hard at something that maybe I shouldn't have and took me a long time to figure that out. Um, and so the relationship in this book was my third marriage. And I really wanted that to you know, I didn't want to fail yet again, right? Everybody hates the feeling of failing. Um, and, and yet illness had another plan for me on that. Um, but but you said shame, you know, shame kept me from telling this story, which I think is a very good story and a very valuable story for people to hear um, because I was ashamed of that history. And at one point I realized, you know, there are people out there who write memoirs of truly what I would think are horrible and shameful things. And they put them out there and they go on book tour and whatever. They don't seem to have a problem of it. Why am I so freaked out about my pretty mundane life in some ways here? I should just get over myself and do what I want to do, which is step into being more of a writer. Um, yeah, back in, I think the late nineties, there was a, a woman, Catherine Harrison, who published a memoir called The Kiss which was about her having an affair with her father, like literally full on consenting adults. They did that. And then she wrote a book about it. And I'm thinking if she can write that book, I can put my book out for God's sakes. I got to get over myself. Well, just because she wrote it didn't mean she doesn't didn't have negative repercussions as a result. I mean, that's massively taboo. Exactly. And that's probably why she wrote it. But uh, I, I'm just saying it. People who have done far more courageous things and publishing far more revealing stories than mine. And I was, I was being all, I don't know, scared, precious, shameful, something. And I needed to just get over it. That, that's my past. I can't change it. In a lot of ways, it's shaped me who I am for the better. So let's just embrace who I am and go forward. It's part of my story. So it's funny that you mentioned shame as well because the person I'm recording with next, our episode is about shame. So she, she's a, a coach, and one of the things she recognized a lot of the people she works with um, have in common is that they feel deep shame. And so we are gonna talk about you know shame as an entrepreneur and how it can basically destroy your business and yourself if you don't just get the hell over it. So that's like an hour in a nutshell. But uh, <laughs> that's a fascinating topic. And if you look at Brene Brown, who has become this global phenomenon, her sociological research was on shame. I mean, that's that's how she sees herself as a shame researcher, even though she's done all of these other things. That's who she is at her core. And it's been a powerful topic. And it's especially powerful for men. I think men are programmed to always be strong, to never fail, to always have an answer, to always be capable. And if you if you fail on those things, it's shameful. You have failed as a man. Um, and I think that's something guys need to get over. Absolutely. I had said to you previously, I thought that it was, it, it wasn't the story that I was expecting because I know so many people that made a lot of money fast, lost a lot of money fast, and then made it back again fast. 
but you decided to go the slow route and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, I think, unique for my generation to hear that, you know, look, slow and steady wins the race. It's okay. And it's true because there are probably thousands or tens of thousands or more people like you in America that are like the quiet millionaires next door that people don't realize you have this money. You just work, you work hard, you work smart, you spend your whole life at it and, and you just do it. Um, and those people are more likely to keep that money because they're not flaunting it. They're not blowing it on stupid things. Like I'm, I met a guy, I won't say who he is. Uh, he, he's not a guest. I haven't interviewed him before. But he was like 25, 26. He's like, I did an e-com business, made millions of dollars, and honestly, I blew it all on the clubs. Blew it on women, blew it on drugs, blew it on partying. And I woke up one day and I realized I needed to stop that. And then I started again. And I made it all back again. Took a few years. Now I'm like married with kids and, and made the money back. But like, I realized I had to do it different. So that's why I really like your story because it's like, it's different from how we would approach it. Um, so at what point did you realize you needed to make a change and you needed to start over? Wow. So literally, um, so my wife passed away from this disease, porphyria, in June of 2003. And I kept the paper going as much as I could uh, until one day, uh, I want to say, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the actual, whether it was October or November of that year. Oh, it must have been November. It was right at the start of November. I literally woke up on a Saturday morning and the first thing in my head was, I have to stop this. It was just, there was this absolute moment of clarity of I'm, I'm now officially done and need to be done. I've done everything that I know to do to try and make the situation work. And I spent the rest of the month, I said, I'm going to have this paper sold by the end of the month. I did. It was a horrible deal. And I ended up having to take it back. But that was the moment that I just knew stuff's got to change immediately. Um, but it took me another, almost another year to completely unwind that. And I ended up essentially just closing the business, selling some assets and doing what I can and figuring out how to recharge and go forward. So how did you recharge? Once the paper was finally closed, I literally went home and barely got out of bed or my pajamas for like six weeks. I was just completely exhausted. Um, the pets I had at the time thought it was great. Hey, he's home all day, he's lying around, he's warm. This is great, we're gonna have a pajama party for a month. Um, but I needed that, I was completely physically and spiritually exhausted. Um, after that, uh, you know, I finally started noticing, well, I'm feeling a little better. I have a little more energy. Um, and there's a whole chapter in the book about how do you sort of wake up again from being that spent? Um, and I, I sort of worked my way back. I was not ready. I had no ideas, first of all, to, to start another business. And I was not ready to do it. Uh, so I ended up doing some contract work, which led to being an employee um, and sort of went back to low risk, steady state sort of stuff. One thing that wasn't clear to me the last time we talked that still isn't clear to me is after she died, what happened with the kids? Did you continue to live with them? Did they go with like their grandparents? Like what, what happened? She had three sons um, and they were all from previous relationships. They weren't any of our biological kids. And so um, the oldest one who was uh, when her when his mom passed away was 17, um, wanted to stay with me. His dad said, you should come live with me in Las Vegas. And um, Brad was his name said, no, A, I feel like this is my home and B, you know, I have serious medical issues from porphyria as well. I'm in no state to pick up and move to a whole nother community and find doctors and all that other stuff. I, I'm just not ready to do that. Um, 
the his two half brothers who were Walt and Chris who were younger did stay with their dad who lived in Spokane. He lived you know a few blocks away, frankly. Um, my thought at the time was, you know, I I didn't have a lot of respect for their dad after some of the stunts he had pulled. You know, everybody has stories about that sort of situation, but I felt like what those kids needed was some peace. They didn't need any more stress from illness or parents fighting or anything else. They needed some stability in their life. And could I deliver that? I don't think I was in a position then. I still had a very sick kid to look after. I had a business that I was still trying to run. I was pretty depleted. Um, I had no legal claim on them. Like I hadn't adopted them. I wasn't officially their parent. And so it just seemed like the right thing to do is, okay, I may not have great respect for their dad, but he seems like he can at least be a passable parent for them. And, and that was the better choice, I thought. You said the name of this illness once or twice, but I've, I've never heard of it. What is it? And, and how, how did they both get it at the same time? What the heck is it? So it's called porphyria, and it's actually a class of diseases. Um, and the way it works, your body produces a chemical called heme. It's part of hemoglobin, which most people know. So heme is uh, a molecule that transfers oxygen around the body. You need it. It's a very crucial thing. When your body synthesizes heme, it's an eight-step process. You know, if you remember high school chemistry, that you know, this, then this, then this, right? Um, if your body, and, and at the end of each of those steps, there are byproducts that are left over from the chemical reactions. And your body produces enzymes to clean up those byproducts of whatever that step was. So the, the disease family porphyria is you lack one of those enzymes from one of those eight steps. So there's eight different types of porphyria. And what happens is these porphyrins, as they're known, that can build up if they're not cleaned up by enzymes, go on to become a neurotoxin in your body. They can attack any voluntary or involuntary nervous system throughout your body, which makes porphyria a very hard disease to diagnose because it looks like everything else. You know, because if it attacks this nervous system, it looks like a disease of that nervous system, not of the blood, basically. And because it's blood, it can go anywhere. So it can cause all sorts of problems. And, and it, it really does look different for different people. Um, it is a genetic thing. That's how, you know, my wife had it and then her kid had it. Um, it so it is something that can travel through families as well. It's just strange how they kind of got it at the same time. Yeah, and, and that's sort of coincidental in some ways. Um, my wife had had about a very bad illness years before I had met her. I mean, just horrible stuff um, that had no explanation at the time. Uh, and so looking back, once she was diagnosed with porphyria, then it's like, oh, maybe that's what that was. That, you know, two years of being absolutely incapacitated. Maybe that's what that was. But rare disease is an interesting thing, and I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a moment. I know this is not your audience, but um, there are as many people in America, <clears throat> excuse me, suffering from a rare disease as there are people suffering from cardiac disease. Cardiac disease is the number one killer in the U.S. But there's just as many people who are going through something that takes two to 15 years to get a diagnosis. That's the path of somebody with a rare disease. They go from specialist to specialist, having um, either being told you don't have something, <clears throat> it's all in your head, or you have this other thing that is the thing I know because it fits in my box of my daily practice, um, or you're going to, let's do this surgery on you, which turns out to be horribly invasive and expensive and does nothing because it's an incorrect diagnosis. Um, so finally getting an accurate diagnosis, finding a community, and getting to a new phase in their life. I mean, honestly, if they haven't died along the way, because rare diseases are often very severe diseases as well. Um, 
And so that's what happened with, with Connie. She had been on this journey and finally got a diagnosis. With porphyria specifically, and her type of porphyria, one pattern that it uh, exhibits is you have a significant outbreak, flare up, whatever you want to call it, at, at the end of puberty. And so as her kid was 16, 17, that's what happened. That's, that's pretty rough. It is. It's tough. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to, to bring this book out and talk about this is it does happen to so many people. And yet, because their specific little disease, I shouldn't call it little, but their very specific disease um, keeps them in a very small community. They need to see that there's a much bigger community of people going through the same thing, maybe for slightly different reasons, but they're having the same experience. Um, and as a society, we do a little bit to help these people. I mean, we do have, there's some laws that protect um, what are known as orphan drugs. They're drugs that can't make money because they serve a very small population, but without it, people will die. And so we as a society try to make a market for those sorts of things. Um, we have, there's organizations like the National Organization of Rare Diseases that tries to advocate for this group in general. And then there's organizations for each specific disease or a lot of them. Um, but people need to know that they're not alone in this, that there's literally 8% of the U.S. population going through this as patients and then their families on top of that. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are trying to run businesses and dealing with these illnesses themselves. You know, I, I wouldn't be ashamed of, as you said, going on a, going off on a tangent because, you know, just like the episode that I'm going to do about shame, this is stuff that we're all dealing with. I mean, I don't really talk about it on air, but my mom has dementia and she's 62 and we've been fighting for almost 10 years to figure out what it is. We don't even, we, we, we don't even know what it is. There's no diagnosis whatsoever. We've tried this thing. We've tried that thing. We have no idea. All we know is it affects her prefrontal cortex. It affects her executive functioning. She struggles to plan, to strategize, to execute, to organize. She struggles to cook, to clean, to pay the bills. She gets lost driving sometimes. She gets lost in thought during conversations. And like people didn't, people outside of our family didn't start to notice until two or three years ago, but it's been plaguing us. It's been extremely stressful and, and uh, detrimental to our well being. You know, I, I come home every year for two or, or three or four months just so that I can spend time with my parents and help my dad somewhat to take care of my mom. But I'm also helping to take care of his stuff because, you know, he he has his own issues and trying to help my grandma because my dad's working and my mom can't work. And so, like, I'm I'm 36 years old, but I've been a, a caregiver for at least the last five years. And while I'm not here full time because couldn't do it i'm here for months out of the year to do the best that i can to give them the best life that they can have and uh, i think a lot more people are going through these kinds of things than than we think because a lot of people don't really talk about it and that's why i try to like i've been i've been pretty straightforward and open about my my weight loss and my divorce and the struggles with my startup and now stuff with my mom and 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 all of that and uh so i look at the podcast as kind of therapy for me because because, because uh like for example when i when i came to you it was like i've been through that i want to know what your experience has been um and so like the shame thing is interesting because yeah i felt shame sure um you know i i, I am going to be interviewing someone who had post postpartum depression and is an entrepreneur and so well, granted, I haven't had kids and I'm not a mother and I probably won't know what postpartum depression is. That doesn't mean there aren't entrepreneurs out there that are struggling with it. So, um, so yeah, don't, don't feel ashamed about taking airtime to talk about something that's important that we're all going through. That's the whole existence of this podcast is to talk about things that we as entrepreneurs are dealing with. It's our life. It's, it's the, the stuff that's going on that, that makes us who we are.
Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a, a tough story about your mom. That's very early onset dementia. Um, doctors have this great word idiopathic. I don't know if you've run into it, but it, it, it basically means for them of unknown origin. In other words, we don't know where the hell this illness came from. Your mom, if you read through your mom's charts, I bet you you'll find the phrase idiopathic dementia, dementia that we don't have any explanation for. And I think, I think a lot of us have things that are idiopathic to other people, right? It's just our stuff. However it showed up, we got to deal with it. That, that's where I was going with that. There's multiple potential reasons why this has happened. We haven't been able to pinpoint any of them. There's, there's enough evidence that like it might be this thing, but it's, but not enough evidence to say that it's not, or maybe it's another thing that's happened in her life, but maybe it's, it's multiple things put together. It's like so, so difficult to, to put it together. My dad went through something similar before he passed away. Um, he had probably been having some dementia sort of symptoms that he, he hid pretty well, honestly. Um, and then he had some seizures, which were completely unexplained. Like we have no idea why they showed up. Um, and it was only, you know, several years into this journey that somebody finally said, oh, now you have something that we can call Alzheimer's. But at that point, it's like, oh, great, you have a name for it, but that doesn't really help us. Right? It, it didn't really do much at that point. Um, but I, I think the other part of this, um, well, I also wanted to say, you're absolutely right. Caregiving is really tough. And I think as a society, we have learned a lot more about how hard and important that is because of the pandemic. There are so many more people out there who have gone through being a caregiver or they're a caregiver now to somebody who is, you know, either acutely or chronically suffering from just pandemic related stuff. Um, but for, for the audience of entrepreneurs, Problems are also opportunities, right? I think we need to see things like caregiving as a place that is fully worth entrepreneurial thought as much as anything else. It's a huge area that needs to be better. And lots of entre entrepreneurs would look for what's a big area that needs to be better that I could possibly improve. Caregiving is a great, great field of opportunity for somebody. In Japan, they're looking at it from the point of view of loneliness. But oftentimes people who are ill also become lonely because they don't get enough face time with loved ones or or elderly people in the same vein. They might be otherwise healthy but lack face time with loved ones and that can create existential depression and loneliness. And so uh, this is going on in Japan now where they've had this demographic bomb that's gone off and they just don't have enough young people to take care of the elderly while continuing to have the next generation be born and work in in the economy in order to keep it going they're just struggling there's just not an, like they there's just not enough people being born and so they've had to approach it from let's create robots that can keep the elderly company that's like the best thing they could think of where, where in America, we, we've said, let's create robots to keep our animals lo not lonely while we're out of the house. Right. So, um, <laughs> right. So yeah, I think robots are a potential way to handle this kind of stuff. Um, obviously there's a lot of other ways. I, I have a VR headset that I use daily. I would love for my grandma to have a VR headset. But she's 90. She can't lift her hand. Like, she, she can't even... She can't do this. Her shoulders are frozen. Her neck's messed up. She's got pain all over. She couldn't... You know, she's got arthritis in her hand. She couldn't even operate it if she wanted to. And I think VR could be an amazing solution. Um, I know I gave my dad my VR headset to try. And I ended up putting him in Horizon Worlds, which is a, a meta app. And... He was in some like VR concert that was going on live and he said some kids came up to him in the VR world and they were giving him high fives and he said one of the um, people like gave him a kiss on the cheek like all sorts of weird shit and he, he loved it. He was like it was an amazing experience and he was just sitting on his couch. You know but I also introduced him to like ping pong and mini golf and these other sports and he was like this is incredible I would do this all the time if I could. 
Now, granted, I left my VR headset when I went to Europe for six months, and guess what? It never left the case. But that's a different story. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things that, are, that we're doing that could be helpful. But, but we, got, we got on that on opportunity. So making that technology much more accessible in a medical or caregiving uh, environment, that's a great opportunity, right? Yeah. There's evidence that VR, for example, could help with um, symptoms of autism. Um, but then, again, there's also evidence that psychedelics could be helpful with uh, existential depression. And I mean, not, not evidence, like fact. There's tremendous amount of research that has proven without a shadow of a doubt that, that psychedelics have been amazing for curing depression. Curing depression. Um, curing treatment res resistant depression, which is really just a fancy way of saying the drugs didn't work because the person didn't change their lifestyle to actually live a way that they wanted to live. And so they're going to continue to be depressed. Um, and there's also stem cells. Like I'm, I'm really passionate about and, and excited about the future because of those three things in particular, virtual reality, psychedelics, and, and stem cells. I think the three of them have massive potential to change the way we live on a daily basis and make people happier, healthier, and more connected. Put them together and write your first sci-fi novel. Well, maybe not together, but... <laughs> well, yeah, so I, I, I do microdose. So I actually, I'm microdosing today. Um, I microdose a few days a week. And one of the things I'm actually doing for my mom right now is I'm helping her wean off her antidepressants. For the first time in seven years, she's going to be completely off antidepressants in the next two weeks. And how's she doing? And she seems to be doing okay. The reason why we're doing it is because we want to see her go through a psychedelic trip that she's, she's agreed to do. Because we believe that the science will show that psychedelics can help her mental condition. And I also want to get her into a stem cell study, but that's a lot harder. Because there's evidence that stem cells, that a stem cell injection directly into the brain can undo damage from a stroke six months after, more than six months after. So if, if you have damage to your brain, and stem cells can fix it, can make it so that you didn't even have it, then why can't it undo dementia? That's a great question. Absolutely, that's fascinating. I hadn't heard that. I, I know that, I mean, psychedelics have even been on 60 Minutes, right? They've done a segment on how psilocybin has helped people with serious depression, and really quickly too. Same thing with ecstasy. Um, those two drugs have a lot of therapeutic uh, possibilities that have not been fully exploited yet. I would put my money on psilocybin over ecstasy any day. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to talk about as we come to a close? I think entrepreneurs do things because they love to do things. Money is great, but at least my impression is they're not motivated solely by money. That, And I think if you want to pursue the things that that you really want to do, doing them as an entrepreneur or doing them as a more traditional employee, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. But I, I think it's forming the career, the portfolio, the life you want to have. And if it's entrepreneurial or employee, or you go back and forth or a mix of both with a side hustle, I think it's all good. Um, I think the main thing is do what is suited for you, what makes you you. Absolutely. So how can people follow up with you? They can certainly find me on LinkedIn um, under just my good old name. Uh, you can visit my website, matthewspore.com, to learn more about my book, which is Making a Small Fortune right there. Um, also at matthewspore.com, there's links. Uh, I have a menu called My Day Jobs uh, that points to my marketing site and also my voiceover work. I am a, an audiobook narrator as well. So yeah, would love to hear from people. Um, I think you're probably building a really fascinating audience by focusing on, on the humanity of being an entrepreneur. It's something that a lot of people don't really cover. That's, that's, my, that's my niche. That's, that is my passion. It's where 
you know, my, my educational background is in psychology and my passion is entrepreneurship and doing things that other people aren't doing or trying to find ways to make money doing cool things and putting them together is really with the intersection of where the, the podcast lies. Very cool. It's been great talking. Yeah, you too. So uh, if you like this episode, don't forget to share this with your friends. Let them know about uh, what we're doing here. It's very unique, very special. And 123 episodes. We got a lot more coming up at the end of this year and into next year. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day because you don't know what your last day is going to be. Thank you, Matthew. Amen. Thank you, Sean.